From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Our way of delivering health care in this country is incredibly inefficient. And this is paradoxical, because I'm actually, despite my public image, is actually a fairly conservative and free market person, relative to others in my party. But the paradoxical thing is the free market simply doesn't work in health care. The public uh, entity is much more efficient at delivering health care. I say this not as a single-payer advocate. I've not ever been a huge single-payer advocate. In fact, I fought against it when I was governor. Howard Dean's prescription for real health care reform. The former presidential candidate, governor of Vermont, and medical doctor joins us for the hour to discuss the health care debate in Congress, his time as head of the Democratic National Committee, and his solutions to fixing the nation's health care crisis. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Afghanistan, at least five civilians have been killed and another 13 injured in a U.S. airstrike. The Pentagon says U.S. forces had called for the strike after coming under fire. Most of the victims were members of the same family, and the dead included a four-year-old girl. Witnesses said U.S. forces fired on the family members as they tried to flee their home. Meanwhile, at least 11 civilians were killed earlier today in a roadside bombing in Kandahar. The dead included five children. In Indonesia, at least nine people have been killed and another 50 wounded in bombings on two luxury hotels in the capital city of Jakarta. The attacks occurred within minutes of the other. It was the worst militant bombings to hit Indonesia since 2005. In Honduras, thousands of people blocked main roads Thursday in the ongoing protest for the return of the democratically elected President Manuel Zelaya. The blockades came amidst rumors Zelaya is making his second attempt to return to Honduras since his ouster. Earlier this month, the coup government blocked Zelaya's plane when he tried to land at Honduras's main airport. Speaking in Bolivia, Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez said Zelaya had told him of his plans to return. President Zelaya is ready to return to Honduras. They haven't been able to frighten him. He told me, Honduras has many borders, on land, on sea. I'm not going to go running around the world. I'm not going to finish my time feeling bad for myself. I prefer to die in Honduran territory. Let's accompany Zelaya on his path to dignity. Chavez was in Bolivia to mark the 200th anniversary of Bolivian independence. On Thursday, Bolivian President Evo Morales honored the struggle of indigenous people in Bolivia's history. Today we are honoring these native leaders, mestizos and criollos as well. But we must remember that the native people not only fought for the independence of this country, but mainly for the rights. The U.S. is nearing an agreement to use three military bases inside Colombia. The Colombian government says the bases would be used for joint anti-drug operations. The 10-year deal would also extend the current arrangement, allowing up to 1,400 U.S. troops and military contractors on Colombian soil. Opposition Colombian Senator Gustavo Petro called the plan a violation of sovereignty. This treaty aims to allow United States troops to be in Colombia. As a sovereign country, we must respect the fact that only Colombian troops have the right to be in Colombia. Colombia is the largest recipient of U.S. military aid in the Americas. Supreme Court nominee Sonia Sotomayor appears headed to a speedy confirmation after her last day of questioning on Capitol Hill. On Thursday, the ranking Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Jeff Sessions, said he won't try to filibuster a vote on Sotomayor's nomination. During her closing remarks, the judge said her judicial record is untainted by personal views. I would tell them to look at my decisions for 17 years. And note that in every one of them, I have done what I say that I so firmly believe in. I prove my fidelity to the law, the fact that I do not permit personal views, sympathies, or prejudices to influence the outcome of cases. A full Senate vote on Sotomayor's nomination is expected to come early next month.
Senate Democrats have dropped a key proposal from the Employee Free Choice Act, a bill that would make it easier for workers to join unions. On Thursday, Senate negotiators said they would drop a card check provision that would require employers to recognize a union if a majority of workers signed cards in favor of unionization. Labor groups had made card check their top priority in the bill's passage, but the provision came under intense opposition from business lobbyists swaying several so-called moderate Senate Democrats. President Obama spoke in New York on Thursday in the 100th anniversary of the NAACP, the nation's largest civil rights group. In what NAACP President Benjamin Jealous described as Obama's most forthright speech on race since taking office, Obama sounded off on his recurrent theme of urging personal responsibility. Government programs alone won't get our children to the promised land. We need a new mindset, a new set of attitudes, because one of the most durable and destructive legacies of discrimination is the way we've internalized a sense of limitation. How so many in our community have come to expect so little from the world and from themselves. The financial giant J.P. Morgan Chase has announced second quarter profits of over $2.7 billion. The company repaid $25 billion in TARP aid last month, but continues to rely on other federal help through the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the Federal Reserve. J.P. Morgan is the second major Wall Street firm to post a huge profit this week, following Goldman Sachs' announcement of a $3.44 billion second quarter. And the American Conservative Union is coming under scrutiny for offering to back the shipping company FedEx in a legislative dispute in return for a $2 million payment. According to Politico, the ACU approached FedEx with a proposal to publicly lobby against legislation that would force the company to negotiate union contracts locally instead of nationwide. In its letter to FedEx, the ACU said, quote, we stand with FedEx in opposition to this legislation. But when FedEx declined to pay the ACU for its public support, the group switched sides and backed rival company UPS, which supports the measure. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Well, Juan, it's good to have you back in New York. You've been in Washington for the last four days covering the Sotomayor confirmation hearings. Yes, and, and a, a really a historic uh, hearings. Uh, Judge Sotomayor did very well in terms of being able to respond to a, a wide range of questions. Obviously, as, as most Supreme Court uh, nominees in recent years, she refused to talk about her opinions about anything that might be pending legislation. Uh, but I think, generally speaking, she did very well impressed uh, not only the Democrats, who were already favorable to her, but uh, many of the Republicans as well. And it's now expected that uh, she'll have easy sailing in terms of her confirmation uh, by the Senate. Uh, I think one of the things I wanted to point out that got almost no attention uh, was Judge Sotomayor's response to questionings by both uh, Senators Cole and Grassley about the issue of uh, Kilo, the uh, the New Haven uh, case, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, New London case, uh, where uh, dealt basically with the issue of eminent domain and under what conditions could governments take uh, private property for uh, for public uses, uh, uh, especially for private developments. Uh, and interestingly, uh, I think that this may be one of the, fir the, the first cases where her being on the Supreme Court may make a major difference. Uh, that case was decided 5-4, and it was basically the conservative justices uh, on the court uh, who were in the dissent on this issue. And while she clearly stated that it is now precedent, what uh, the decision of Kilo, uh, she clearly said that she understands the public concern and citizen concern. And she specifically noted that in one particular case that she handled uh, that had to do with a government's taking of private properties, uh, she upheld the citizens because they were able to challenge the, the method by which the government took the property. And on two occasions, she said, I hear you, I understand the issue. Uh, and while she could not say how she would rule in, in the future, I think that if she were to 
turn on that issue of Kilo, that would mean uh, a really a possible change in terms of how eminent domain cases would be dealt with in the future when it comes to private development. Uh, the uh, government's taking property for private developers to use for what is, quote, a public purpose. So I think that's a, that's a, ch uh, that's a, a nuance of her testimony that didn't get any attention in any of the coverage that I've seen. And overall, just the atmosphere of the hearing room and the hard office building. Well, it was jammed uh, to 200 to 250 reporters early on. It dropped off in the last couple of days. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the sense uh, that the court and the country was about to make history with the first uh, Hispanic member of the Supreme Court uh, was clearly evident, the third woman. Uh, and I think, again, uh, I, th I think Mayor Bloomberg had one of the funniest lines when he uh, testified. He said, it's good to see the court is having diversity since it already has a justice uh, uh, from Brooklyn and a justice from Queens. Now we'll have a justice from the Bronx as well. <laughs> you, uh, you mean we're about to have a wise Latina justice? <laughs> right, a wise Latina justice, indeed. <laughs> well, uh, we move on to today's top story and our guest for the hour. Juan? Well, the House Ways and Means Committee approved legislation early this morning to overhaul the nation's health care system and expand insurance coverage. By a 23 to 18 vote, the committee backed key elements of President Obama's blueprint for health care, including the creation of a new government health plan and requirements for employers to offer health insurance to workers or contribute to its cost. To help fund the changes to the health care system, the House Committee also agreed to impose a surtax on families with incomes of more than $350,000 a year. The 23 to 18 vote was largely on party lines, with three Democrats joining Republicans up to oppose the legislation. Two other House panels, the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Education and Labor Committee, are also working on health care legislation. There were two other major developments on health care uh, on Thursday. The chief of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, Doug Elmendorf, said none of the health care legislation proposed so far will significantly curb federal spending on health care. Testifying before the Senate Budget Committee, Elmendorf said the legislation does not offer, quote, the sort of fundamental changes that would be necessary to reduce the trajectory of federal health spending by a significant amount. Some reports suggest the Congressional Budget Office did not fully analyze the House bill's cost-saving measures, but Elmendorf's comments are widely seen as a setback to Congressional Democrats racing to meet President Obama's August deadline for completing the legislation. Meanwhile, the conservative American Medical Association has just come out in support of the House bill, saying, quote, the status quo is unacceptable. AMA President J. James Rohack said they, they, quote, look forward to additional constructive dialogue as the bill moves through the House. Throughout its history, the AMA has opposed most efforts at health care reform, including leading the charge in the mid-1960s against the creation of Medicare. Well, our guest for the hour is a man who is passionate about what he calls real health care reform. Physician, six-term Vermont governor, Democratic presidential candidate in 2004 and former chair of the Democratic National Committee, Howard Dean. He's now the author of a new book called Howard Dean's Prescription for Real Health Care Reform. Along with co-authors Igor Volsky and Faya Shakir, Dr. Dean argues the current health care system not only leaves Americans at the mercy of the insurance industry interests, it's also devastating the national economy. The solution embraces President Obama's health care plan, but argues that the reform bill is, quote, not worth passing unless the American people have the choice of signing up for a public option, a real public option. Well, Howard Dean joins us here in the Firehouse studio. We welcome you to Democracy Now! Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you with us. Um, so, Dr. Dean, your assessment of the proposal in Washington. Uh, well, it took a big step forward yesterday. Um, this, the, and oddly enough, the AMA, which is certainly uh, not what it was 20 years ago, for them to support this is, a, is an earthquake. Uh, it's been a very conservative organization, generally not representing the most primary care physicians because it's expensive and they, they are so conservative. Um, it's just a shocking thing. And it, it, I think it actually would, the Republicans would do well to learn from this because the AMA has embraced this, including the public option. And it wasn't any shilly shallying around or these funny little words that the other industries have said, well, maybe on the one hand and the other hand. I think they'll have a seat at the table to really shape this bill so that it works for physicians. And I frankly wish the Republicans would get with the program. Seventy-two percent of Americans think they ought to have a choice between a public option and what they have today. If the Republicans were to get on board with that, then they could actually have some say in, in shaping it and making it work, because that's the only way we're, we're going to have real health care reform. 
And your, uh, what is your sense as to why the AMA made this switch? There were some reports that the, the members of Congress agreed to uh, not implement cuts in reimbursements to doctors uh, through, uh, uh, through Medicare as, as part well, of the uh, Yeah, and that's smart for both sides. Uh, the truth is that you're getting fewer and fewer primary care physicians in this country. Nine percent of the current graduating classes indicated they're going into public uh, to uh, um, internal medicine and primary care. And that's because, in part, because of these enormous cuts. It's also because of the disgraceful behavior of the insurance industry in interfering with doctor and patient uh, relationships. So you need to have more primary care people, not just physicians, but also uh, nurse practitioners and so forth. In order to do that, you can't cut reimbursement. So it was a win for both sides. The AMA got what it needed to serve the continue to, for doctors to continue to serve the public, and the uh, and the House got a very powerful advocate. Uh, because of the surprise of this conservative organization now coming out and supporting the public option. Explain what is the public option as it's been presented. It, it, for the average American, they should best think of it as Medicare. Now there's an upcry, you know, the administration doesn't want us to talk. But just, we've had a single payer in this country for 40 years. It's called Medicare. The Republicans didn't like it then. We've had what the Republicans call socialized medicine in this country for 40 years. It's called Medicare. Everybody over 65 has it. The only other group besides the disabled people and those over 65 that have socialized medicine is Congress. All these people who are yelling and screaming about socialized medicine have it themselves. They go downstairs, they see the doctor, they don't get a bill, there's no line, and it works great for them. So, and veterans. So the truth is, this is all nonsense, all these, this posturing and this, uh, this uh, spinning and all so forth. This is an attempt to bring order to the health care system. We have no order. This is a chaotic, quote unquote, system. The reason for the public option is it, it like Medicare, it's certainly not perfect, but the cost has gone up much less rapidly than the private sector costs. And their administrative costs are 4 percent and administrative costs in the private sector are 20 percent, sometimes more, depending on the return on equity, these public health care uh, uh, insurance companies uh, get. And so the, the Medicare is just a lot more efficient than the private sector health care is. Now, in your book, you talk about the public option as uh, in many ways preferable to the single payer system only because of, you say, the historical uh, sense of Americans that they want to have choice. Could you talk about well, that? Well, it's hard to define. Here, here's that you get into a very sort of a delicate game about single payer. What I think what single payer advocates mean is that everybody should be in a government run system. But if you're going to argue, as the book does, that we shouldn't have politicians and bureaucrats and insurance companies making this decision, this decision belongs in the hands of the American public, which is why this movement for, to, to change the health care system is so much more powerful this time around than it was 15 years ago. If you're going to make that argument, then it's pretty hard to turn around and say, well, on the other hand, the government can make a choice and put you all in their system. The other problem is nobody really knows what a single payer is. A single payer, I said, is Medicare. But there are a lot of private, ins private insurance and private dollars in Medicare. The British, which have arguably the most, quote unquote, pure single payer or socialized system in the Western world, 15 percent of all the dollars in health care in Britain are private dollars. So there is no such thing as a pure single payer system and what the president is arguing what i argue is give people a choice let them choose whether they want a government system or they like what they have they can keep it one of the critics of president obama's call for a public option um, has been quentin young a uh, personal friend of the obamas from chicago former doctor of the reverend martin luther king uh, young says the public option just doesn't go far enough this public option is not a, a slide toward uh, single payer, unfortunately. Uh, this is a bugbear that has haunted American medicine debate, and we have to bring it to an end because it's too costly. The whole idea that this is socialized medicine, government medicine. We have magnificent examples of government medicine, and reactionaries would never dream of, of, of calling them back. I speak of the VA system for veterans, the public hospitals, the safety net for, for the very poor. We have uh, a variety variety of, of, of public systems. Medicare. Is anybody here advocating an end of Medicare? And that's the government medicine that they're making a fuss about. We are, haven't got much time left. The system, as Obama aptly notes, is running amok, and it's up to $2.5 trillion, and as uh, we all know, rising at a rate two or three times the rate of inflation. And he's right in saying this, the economy can't tolerate it. Where he's wrong is his unwilling 
willingness to, to, to do the serious job of getting the multi-payer insurance companies out of the mix. They add nothing. They subtract a great, great deal. Public experience with the, this system is, is horrible. We have a, a million people having personal bankruptcy due to unpaid medical bills. And that just went up from 50 percent of personal bankruptcies to 60 to uh, 60 percent. 62, to be accurate. And, and this country, rich as it is, in this economic downturn, cannot tolerate it. Dr. Quentin Young, a close friend of President Obama's when he was, well, back in Chicago, uh, one of the leading advocates of uh, single-payer, government-paid uh, universal health care in the country. Dr. Dean. Yeah, look, I don't position myself against single-payer, but I position myself for giving the American people a choice. I think what the president understands is the country is a conservative country with a small c. That is, they, they want change, but like most human beings, they don't want so much that they're uncomfortable. And so the genius of the Obama health care plan is it's not that the health care plan that an academic would, would write in the ivory tower, but it starts from where we are, not where we would have been. The Europeans all have single payers because they're essentially their health care systems were destroyed during World War II. And they went to a single payer during the war as a necessity, and they turned out they loved it and didn't want to get away from it afterwards. Winston Churchill was the was the person who put in single payer, essentially, in, in, in Britain. who was a conservative prime minister. In this country, we didn't have. We had exactly the opposite. Our, not only was our health care system not destroyed, but it was driven towards a private sector system because it was the only way that you could give your employees wage increase in the price control and infl anti-inflation atmosphere around World War II. So here we are. We have something we like. Look, health care is like Congress. People hate Congress, but they like their Congress people, and they keep reelecting them. Well, they don't like the health care system, but they like their doctor and they like the kind of health care they get if they have insurance. And in a democracy, 80 percent always trumps 20 percent. The thing I love about Obama's plan is it's politically practical. Instead of saying, this is the right thing to do, as Dr. Young said, and this is what we're going to do, he says, look, you decide for yourself. We're going to if we give you an example. We're going to allow people under 65 to sign up for what people over 65 have. And you make the choice. And what we're all betting is... That the private insurance, and I agree with his comments about the private insurance industry, their, their behavior has been reprehensible, cutting people off where they have uh, illnesses and charging huge uh, sal uh, executive salaries of the big three are over $20 million. The guy that runs CMS, which is a billion claims a year, probably makes $150,000 or $200,000. I mean, it's ridiculous. Let the American people choose. If they make the choice themselves, they will invest emotionally in this system. And I think that, uh, that the insurance industry will be forced to behave in a much better way, or they will be put out of business, but they'll be themselves that's putting themselves out of business and the American people, not the Congress doing it. We're talking to Governor Dean, uh, Dr. Dean, uh, former head of the Democratic National Committee, Howard Dean, his new book, Howard Dean's Prescription for Real Health Care Reform. We'll be back with him in a minute. The Kinks National Health here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. We're broadcasting on 800 stations, on NPR stations, on Pacifica stations, on Low Power FM, college and community radio stations, on public access TV and PBS TV stations, and both TV satellite networks, on Dish Network, Channel 9415, Free Speech TV, on Link TV, Channel 9410, and on Direct TV, Channel 375, and with video and audio podcasting at democracynow.org. Our headlines also available in Spanish for any radio station to take is over 200R and your 
station can too. Just ask them. And the transcripts are there in Spanish on our website every day. As we continue our conversation with Dr. Dean, well, with former Governor Dean of Vermont, former presidential candidate, has now written a new book, Howard Dean's Prescription for Real Healthcare Reform, How We Can Achieve Affordable Medical Care for Every American and Make Our Jobs Safer. I want to ask you, Dr. Dean, <clears throat> about an editorial that appears in today's Wall Street Journal about the Democrats' plan to increase taxes on the wealthy to help cover the cost of expanding health care coverage. The piece is called A Reckless Congress. And it reads in part, the surtax starts at one percentage point for adjusted gross income above $350,000 in 2011, rising to two points in 2013, a 1.5% point surtax at incomes above $500,000, rising to three in 2013, and a whopping 5.4 percentage points in 2011 and beyond on incomes above a million dollars. This would raise the top marginal federal tax rate back to, oh, roughly 47 or 48 percent if you include the Medicare tax and the phase out of certain deductions and exemptions. With the current top rate at 35 percent, this would be the largest rate increase outside the Great Depression or World Wars. This tax, which Democrats say could raise $100 billion or so, would make it even harder for private plans to compete with the government plan, which would already benefit from government subsidies and lower capital costs. And he, they say Democrats want to ram through one of the greatest raids on private income and business in American history. Just part of the Wall Street Journal editorial. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I think the Wall Street Journal is a great paper, but I never read the last two pages because, you know, you can't trust anything they write. It's all propaganda and it has been for years. It is a great paper, as long as you skip the last two pages. Um, the truth is, if of course, this is no such thing. Uh, here's, the, here's how this works, and this is actually a great deal for business. The first thing is, both parties always talk about they're going to do this and that for small business, and neither party ever does, partly because it's hard to help small business, and partly because a lot of politicians talk big and don't deliver a lot during elections, after the election's over. Obama's plan does more to help small business than anything I've ever seen. What they say is small businesses no longer have responsibility for health care. That will be taken care of with a federal subsidy based on income and the employer the employee themselves. Why does that matter? Eighty percent of all the new jobs in America are created by small business. That's why I subtitled it and how to how to save our jobs. Eighty percent of all the new jobs in America are created by small businesses. Health insurance is the bane of their existence. It goes up two or three times the rate of inflation reliably every year. It is a huge expense. If they can't afford it, then they lose their employees. As soon as they get good at what they do, they go and find some job with a benefits package. This is a monumental improvement in our economy. So does, and this figure of a trillion dollars or whatever the number is, the CBO actually scored the House plan a lot lower than that. That's not money that we're just taking out of the private pockets. That, it is increase in taxes. But it is also money that business doesn't have to pay. We're losing jobs to Canada, for God's sakes, not just China, because the Canadians have a system that's not paid for by business. Isn't it partly why GM went under? Yes, absolutely. They went under partly because they're retiree health care costs. And it's true that Canadian companies pay more taxes in order to benefit and have this universal health care system they have. But their taxes don't go up at three times the rate of inflation. And our companies' premiums go up at three times the rate of inflation. The system that we have is crazy, and it is killing America. It is putting money into the health, hands of health insurers and taking it out of industrial complexes and small businesses, which we need to, to create great manufacturing jobs. In your book, however, you had a sort of a different proposals in terms of raising the, uh, yes. the, the, the revenue. You talked about a carbon tax and a 10 cent a gallon increase in the gasoline right. tax because you saw that as not only dealing with the financing of health, of health insurance, but also in terms of goals, in terms of uh, in, uh, reducing emissions, uh, greenhouse emissions. Right. And, and the, you could expect the Wall Street Journal to have an editorial against that, too, if it gets any uh, traction in Congress. This is where I departed from Obama. And I don't really mean this as a criticism in any way, because I resolved about three months ago, as I was writing this book, that I would focus solely on the one critical item that has, is required for reform, which is a public option. If you don't have a uh, public option, this is not reform. And you shouldn't pass the bill, because it's a waste of a trillion dollars, or $600 billion in the case of the House's bill. Uh, so I decided I was not going to take issue with any of the things that the Congress did on tax policy or any of that other stuff, even though there are some things I disagree with, because the focus on the public option was all the difference between the, you fix the tax policy later if you don't like it, but you can't fix whether there is or is not a public option. 
On the other hand, if I were writing the plan, uh, I would use a carbon tax, and here's why. When I was governor, I always resisted increases in gas taxes because my state is a rural state. Like many rural states, the people who drive the farthest to work are the poorest working of the poor. They can't afford housing in the area where they have good jobs, so they drive 50 miles each way to work or more in places like California or Texas. So if you raise the gas tax 10 cents a gallon, who does it hurt the most? It hurts those working people. On the other hand, this is the first thing that I've seen that gives them a great deal. If you asked any of these working pe poor people, or not, they're not all working poor, working people, but certainly not at the upper end of the income scale. If you ask any of them, if you could have health insurance at an affordable rate that could never be taken away, whether you got sick or whether you got laid off or whether you had to take a different job, and if you, would you be willing to pay 10 cents a gallon gas? I bet you get 90% say absolutely yes. This is, a, this is a regressive tax that helps those at the bottom more than it does at the top, and therefore I think a regressive tax in this case is, is a, acceptable. Governor Nguyen, yesterday, on Thursday... And of course it does have the environmental benefits. Uh, Democracy Now! aired an extended interview with a former health care executive, Wendell Potter. For years he served as chief of corporate communications at Cigna and uh, as the company's main spokesperson. I asked him about the relationship between his industry, the health insurance industry, and key lawmakers like Senator Max Baucus, chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Well, one thing to, to, to remember is that the health insurance industry has been anticipating this debate on health care reform for many years. Uh, they knew it was inevitable that it would, it would come back, and they knew that if, if a Democrat were elected president, undoubtedly it would be uh, on the top of the political agenda. Uh, so they've been positioning themselves to get very close to influential members of Congress in both parties. And Max Baucus is certainly someone they knew uh, a long time ago was going to be uh, critical for their interests. So yes, the, they, uh, the insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and others in healthcare have div have spent uh, have, have donated lots and lots, millions of dollars to to his campaigns over the the past few years. Um, but aside from money, it's it's relationships that count, and that's why the insurance industry has hired. Uh, scores and scores of lobbyists, many of whom have worked for members of Congress, and some who are former members of Congress, to, to lobby on their behalf. Uh, some of Max Baucus's uh, uh, former staff members work for uh, in, in, in the health insurance industry as lobbyists these days. Uh, that is very important. It helps to open the door, and it enables uh, people who are aligned with the industry who uh, have good associations or, or close associations with members of Congress to uh, pass along the talking points or to express the industry's points of view. And I want to follow that up with, in mid-May, President Obama held a town hall meeting in New Mexico. This is just one question he took from a local resident named Linda Allison. My question is, so many people uh, go bankrupt using their credit cards to pay for health care. Why have they taken single payer off the plate? And why is Senator Baucus on the Finance Committee discussing health care when he has received so much money from the pharmaceutical companies? Isn't it a conflict of interest? If I were starting a system from scratch, then I think that the idea of moving uh, towards a s single payer system could very well make sense. That's the kind of system that you have in f most industrialized countries around the world. The only problem is that we're not starting from scratch. We have historically a tradition of employer based health care. And although there are a lot of people who are not satisfied with their health care, the truth is, is that the vast majority of people currently get health care from their employers, and you've got this system that's already in place. We don't want a huge disruption as we go into health care reform where suddenly we're trying to completely reinvent one-sixth of the economy. As for the question about whether uh, Max Baucus, key in the Senate, head of the Senate Finance Committee, has a conflict of interest, President Obama didn't address it. But what about well, what I am the Cygnus address it. Uh, not, not specifically the, uh, Chairman Baucus, but let me just be very clear about this. This has been cast in the media and probably seen by Republican consultants as a Republican versus Democrat issue or a conservative versus liberal issue. It's not. When 72 percent of the American people, including more than 50 percent of Republicans, believe that they ought to have the choice between a public or a private system, this is not a liberal conservative thing. This is whether you're going to vote with the health insurance companies or whether you're going to vote for what 72 percent of your constituencies want. 
That is what this vote is about. It is a very clear, bright line. And is a, I believe that if we don't pass a health care system with a public, public, a strong public component, not a fake public option, as I call it in the book, uh, co-ops or, you know, we had co-ops. It was called Blue Cross Blue Shield. They basically got taken over by the private industry. Uh, a trigger mechanism, well, someday we'll have a public option if you behave yourself. We've tried that stuff in the past. It doesn't work. A real public option. If you don't have it, I predict that the Democrats are going to lose huge numbers of seats and President Obama's re-election will, re will be in danger. And why? Because it will be clear that we didn't get change, the change we promised. We were promised change where the insurance industry wasn't able to override 72 percent of the American people. Now we have a vote. Are you with the 72 percent of the American people or with you, are you with the health insurance industry? Each person is going to get a chance to vote on that and they're going to be held accountable. Well, one of the most fascinating things I found about your book was the uh, chapters where you compared uh, the various uh, health systems uh, in Europe and other parts of the world, uh, showing that actually health care reform and guaranteeing universal health insurance uh, has many, many possible avenues. And you compared the Dutch and the French and, uh, and not just England and Canada, which are the right. examples all, often raised here when dealing with the question of universal health insurance. Could you talk about that? Yeah, let me say first, I've spent a lot of time in Europe because of my political campaigns. People want to know how they can do that. And so I spend a lot of time. And I talk, a lot, talk to a lot of expatriate Americans in Europe who work for big American companies, but they get their health insurance in Europe. They love it. The Americans who are over there think their system is much better than ours uh, in Belgium and France and places like that. So let's just be clear about this. All these things that these right-wingers are saying about other systems, they're trying to scare the American people, but the American people that I know that have experience with these systems love them. Secondly, there are lots of different ways to do this. There are two countries that I always like to point out, uh, the Netherlands and Switzerland. They do not have government-run single payers. They have private sector insurance, universal. But the reason it works is something that the health insurance industry would hate even more than what we're proposing, which is they treat insurance companies like regulated utilities. They cannot make a certain, more than a certain amount of profit. They can't spend money without the okay of the government. The government gives them money to even off the risk. So they are basically private, for-profit entities that are very heavily regulated, like the utility business. And it works. So, but I don't think the insurance industry would, I think they would prefer what we're proposing rather than what they have in Switzerland and the others. And the, other, and the rest of the system is, in, the, in most of Europe, is mostly uh, public, although every single system has a significant private component to it, as ours will if this bill passes. And in France, which has the best satisfaction rate of all of right. the systems? France has the best satisfaction rate of all the systems. The medical care is rated the highest of any Western country. By, Doc, by its own citizens. Dr. Marsha Angel, the former chief editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, says the Obama plan is unsustainable, that it will break the bank, that only single payer saves money and covers everyone. Um, and why haven't the Democrats demanded that the Congressional Budget Office uh, score single payer? That's a good question. I would not have taken single payer off the table um, because I think there... Look, as I said in the clip, I, I, I'm not a huge advocate of single payer on ideological grounds, nor am I against it. But I, I'll, and, and I have some experience with this. But let me make, just a, as a non, not a particularly wild eyed advocate of one, let me just make this point. The single payer, you've got to look at the, what the facts are. Here's one of the facts about single payer it is by far the most economically efficient system. There's no, it has the lowest overhead. Why? Because their administrative costs are virtually nothing. They're four percent of a single in a single payer. Whereas and most private insurance insurers are about twenty percent. Or the, the best well, the best for-profit ones are around twenty percent. The best not-profit ones are twelve percent. The difference there is return on equity for the shareholders. Now, you know, we we know insurance companies that take fifty percent of your premium dollars and put it in their pocket, either through administrative costs, advertising, huge return on equity. In fact, you get rewarded if you're in the insurance business for taking more out from your clients' pockets, your customers' pockets, and putting it in your own. That's what you get reward. There was a, a shocking piece of testimony on the Capitol Hill a couple of weeks ago with a former insurance executive who said that over the last three years, 20,000 customers had been denied payment deliberately by the top three insurers of the country at a savings at right to the bottom line of $300 million for the insurance industry. They just plain, I think illegally, decided, found some fine print in their insurance policy, which stopped them from having to, to, to um, pay the claims. That's outrageous. 
So it is more effective to have a single payer. Now, there's reasons not to have one. I think people deserve a choice. If, if the system gets too bureaucratic, it's not that Medicare is so great, it's that the insurance industry is so awful. The last, most doctors now, primary care doctors, would prefer a single payer. Not because Medicare's gotten better, it's because the private insurance system has gotten so awful. You know, the rhetoric you hear from the Republicans, this is going to cause an interference with a bureaucrat between you and the, and the doctor, that's what's going on now in the insurance industry, but it doesn't go on under Medicare. It does not. There is no insurance between the government and the patient on, in the single-payer Medicare, but there is interference uh, in the private sector. Can we go to one of your fellow Vermonters? Yes, the Senator Bernie Sanders. We just talked to him, and he spoke about uh, single-payer. Single-payer has been excluded because if we are successful through a single-payer effort, in providing quality, comprehensive, universal health care to every man, woman, and child, there are no more private insurance companies in this country, and the prices that the pharmaceutical industry charges us, charge us will go down. So you have the drug companies, the insurance companies, the medical equipment suppliers, who today make huge amounts of money, billions and billions of dollars, off of health care, fighting us in an unrelentless way through lobbying, campaign contributions, and advertising to make sure that the system, the function of the system, is to make profits for the private insurance companies rather than quality health care to all people. And, Amy, you cannot begin to imagine the power of these special interests who spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in lobbying and campaign contributions on the process. We are wasting close to $400 billion every single year on unnecessary administration on high CEO compensation packages, on outrageous profits for the insurance industry. A few years ago, a guy named William McGuire of United Healthcare, he was given $1.6 billion in stock options at a time when 46 million Americans have no health insurance and the cost of health care is soaring. So I, I think what more and more Americans understand is we need a fundamental overhaul of our system. We need one payer to provide comprehensive, cost-effective health care to all of our people. That's a Vermont independent Senator Bernie Sanders, uh, your fellow Vermonter. Let me just say one thing about this quickly. One of the things that has made this possible, that we're on the verge of real change, is that there has not been the kind of bitter split in the center left between single payer and not single payer. And I think Obama has successfully bridged that bitter bridge by giving that gap by giving individual Americans the choice between whether they would like a single payer for themselves and their families or whether they would not. So the last thing I want to do is get in an argument with Bernie Sanders or anybody else about whether we should or shouldn't have a single payer. We ought to have a public option that Americans can choose from, and it may evolve into a single payer after that. That's what the Republicans keep saying. If the insurance companies do their job properly and satisfy their customers, it won't evolve into a single payer, and that's fine. But if they don't, it will. Let the American people choose. Governor Dean, we're going to go to break, then we're going to come back to you. Howard Dean's prescription for real health care reform, how we can achieve affordable medical care for every American and make our jobs safer is the title of his latest book. Stay with us. Yep, Patty Smith. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Our guest today is Dr. Is Governor Howard Dean. Stay with us. 
Uh, Governor Dean, I'd like to ask you again about the public option. Uh, Republican, uh, House Republican Steve King of Iowa and Louis Gomert of Texas also railed against the public option on the floor of the House this week, blaming what they call socialized medicine for killing people. Here's another place where they think they're going to save. They they're going to save money by rationing care, getting you in a long line, places like Canada, United Kingdom, and Europe. People die when they're in line. Uh, well, if you go to the socialized medicine com uh, uh, com countries, you find about 20% worse results. You get it? One in five people have to die because they went to socialized medicine. Now, I've got three daughters and a wife. I would hate to think that among five women, one of them is going to die because we go to socialized care and we have to have these long lists. Your response? Yeah, this is hooey. They're either making it up or they know nothing about what they're talking about, and we're both. I mean, it's just, look, but you've got to fight against it because we know now from our experience in the last eight years that people believe that stuff. It's absolutely not true at all. In fact, the honest truth is that those countries rank ahead of us in outcomes. Now, the, the health insurance companies are obviously arguing that the public option creates what they consider an uh, uh, unfair playing field uh, and that the mere size of the public option will make it difficult for them to compete. Of course, you could argue the same about Walmart or Home sure. Depot or any, any huge, uh, huge business in the private sector as well. Look, this is not uh, our, our primary concern here is not whether the public insurance, uh, I mean, the private insurance industry makes a lot of money or doesn't make money. Money. That's not what this is about. What this is about is delivering good health care. And the private sector has totally failed to do that in the health insurance business. They have failed to deliver the kind of health care at the price that we deserve. We spend 70% more than the next most expensive nation taking care of our people, and we rank behind all of them. All the Western democracies, the so called socialized system that these guys were raving about, ranting and raving about. The truth, we, we need results. You know, the ta if you want, talk about the taxpayers deserving results for their money. That's what this is about, and it's about giving the American people the choice instead of Representative King and Representative Gohmert, uh, and that's what we want. We want a system that works. This is not about trying to drive the health care business into health care insurance people out of business. I don't give a damn about the health insurance people being in business or out of business. I want a system that works, and if they can give us one, great. I want to ask you, how committed do you think is the Obama administration to the public option? Because there have, been, there have been reports, obviously, Rahm Emanuel was claiming, well, maybe we should agree to a trigger that it would come, in, come into play if the private system could not deliver. Look, I think the president clearly wants a public option. The president is an exceptionally bright guy. He gets that you can't have real reform without a public option. So what's the point of going through this and spending all this money if you're not going to have real reform? There are those in Washington, as Washington always does, who would just like to sign a bill and the signing ceremony, and that'll be a victory. It's not a victory. It's a huge loss, if, unless you do real reform. The president understands that himself. I think the president personally is driving this fight, and it's hard. This is, this is the toughest thing that the president's going to do, unless, God forbid, we should be attacked for, from somebody, which is to drive real reform through the most reform-resistant city in America, which is Washington, D.C., and Max Baucus, uh, I keep naming him as a key player, obviously, in this debate because he is head of Senate Finance, calling for the taxing of health insurance premiums. Well, look, I, I, again, I personally don't favor that for a variety of reasons. I've, we've talked about how I think it should be done. But again, I have said to myself, and I'll say publicly, I am not going to go to the mat for anything else except the public option and then two insurance pieces of reform, guaranteed issue and community rating. But if they're not going to do the public option, they can at least do guaranteed issue and community rating and not spend any money, because we did that 20, 15 years ago in Vermont. Let's, it works great. Let's go back to the Cigna spokesperson, because truly remarkable has become a whistleblower right now right. for so long represented Cigna. His name is Wendell Potter, and we asked him about the healthcare industry's game plan to fight reforming health care. Well, the game plan is based on scare tactics. And, uh, of course, the, the thing they, they fear most is that the country will, at some point, gravitate toward a single-payer plan. Uh, that's the, the ultimate fear that they have. But currently, uh, they know that right now that is not something that's on the legislative table, and they've been very successful in making sure that it isn't. Uh, they, they fear even the public insurance option that's being proposed uh, and that, that was part of President Obama's 
campaign platform, uh, his health care platform, and they'll pull, pull out all the stops they can to defeat that, and they'll be working with their ideological allies, with the business community, with conservative pundits and editorial writers to try to scare people into thinking that uh, embracing a public health insurance option would lead us down the slippery slope, uh, excuse me, slippery slope toward socialism, and that you will be, uh, in essence, putting a government bureaucrat between you and your doctor. That is, that you know, they've used those talking points for years, and, and in years past, they've always worked. Your response? Well, again, we, we talked a little bit about that. The only place that there's a bureaucrat between you and your doctor right now is in the private health insurance industry. It does not happen in the government public-run option. So, you know, I, I think the, 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 he's, he's right. He is a whistleblower, and uh, this is true. It's the insurance companies don't want this because they know it's... Look, the insurance companies, unfortunately, are about t making money for themselves. They really don't care very much about patient care. And that's the been problem is they are paying what was the Washington Post expose, the nation's largest insurers, hospitals, and medical groups have hired more than 350 former government staff right. members and retired members of Congress in hopes of influencing their old bosses and colleagues. Right. But this, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a reason to be cynical. We're on, uh, er, we've really gone through the most extraordinary election in my lifetime. Uh, more people under 35 voted in this country that voted who were over 65 to elect Barack Obama, President of the United States, and ask for real change that we can believe in. This is the test. Are we in charge of the country, or are the insurance executives in charge of the country? And everybody gets to vote on this in Washington. Watch their votes. Watch their votes. Ask Stephen King and Louis Gohmert, are you in favor of the insurance? You want to vote for the insurance companies, or are you going to vote for your people? Because I guarantee in their very conservative districts, People want the public option. Republicans want the public option. Not because they're going to sign up for it. I think they won't. So if there was a CBO score that said only 5% of the people will sign up for the public option. Let us try it. What's working now doesn't work. It doesn't work. We need to be able to try something different, something that succeeded for people over 65. Let people under 65 try it, too. Uh, you mentioned the most... Uh significant election of your lifetime. I'd like to sort of, if we can, just shift a little bit in the few minutes we have left about this election. You, as chairman of the Democratic Party, uh, pressed uh, 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 strenuously for a 50-state strategy that uh, many, in many ways worked. Uh, but some people feel you haven't gotten the credit that you deserve for that strategy. And I'd like to get your, your sense of uh, the, the impact of that strategy on the election. Well, you know, it helps to have a tremendous candidate with a very disciplined campaign, the most disciplined Democratic campaign I've ever seen. Uh, but, yeah, you're, you're going to go into states and ask for people's votes in places like Nebraska and, and, uh, uh, and uh, Virginia and North Carolina. And, and uh, we had a very specific strategy aimed at Colorado and Nevada, uh, New Mexico. You know, they're, they're all Americans. And when I was governor I, and when I ran for president, I believed... You should ask everybody for their vote, including those people who probably aren't going to vote for you, because when you win, you need to be the president of all of America, including those people who didn't vote for you. And I, it's a sign of respect to ask to people's votes. I, and I think what Barack Obama wanted to do more than anything is bring the country together. Uh, and I think he's succeeded. The younger generation wants us to be brought together. Uh, it's the older generation of Republicans who haven't figured any of this out. They haven't figured out that there's a new demographic in the country. They haven't figured out that saying no is no longer an acceptable political uh, operation. They haven't figured out that, that uh, putting their party in front of their country, as they're doing today, with, by refusing to cooperate with the president in any way, is, is not what people under 35 want in this country. And that's until they figure some, a different way of doing business, they're not going to succeed as a, as a party. But we're going to succeed as a country anyway, because this group of people under 35 is not going to lie down in front of the lobbyists and get cynical and give up. Governor Dean, we let people know that you're going to be on our show today, and we have been getting calls and questions, emails, tweets, everything from all over the country nonstop for the last 24 hours, and we hardly have time for any. But this is one from David Swanson. He asked, do you support uh, Representative Kucinich's amendment to allow states to create single-payer health care? Sure, if they absolutely. So I, I've always believed the states ought to be able to try different things. And the states, our state was the first state, I think, to have universal health care for kids, 99 percent eligible. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, well, actually Hawaii, and technically was the first state to do universal health care in its entirety because they were, uh, for technical reasons, it had to do with the Employment Retirement Insurance Security Act. Massachusetts most recently has, has done some groundbreaking things. I absolutely believe that if the people of a state 
uh, want to try something different, that they ought to be able to try it within within the fra federal framework, and that's certainly within the federal. This framework. This is a question from Chester McQuarrie. How do you assess a media system from NPR to PBS to corporate TV and print that almost ev never even uses the word single payer system or Medicare for all, and thus exclude the option that polls show the majority of U.S. citizens and healthcare professionals both favor? Uh, you know, I, I think that is obviously a question with a, with a point of view. Uh, I think I disagree with the polling. I've seen the polling, and and but. Nonetheless, um, you know, I, I think we've spent a lot of time here talking about a single payer, so I, I think the criticism is unfounded. In terms of the, uh, to get back again to, to uh, other issues uh, right now, uh, I'd like to ask you about the continuation and expansion of the American war uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, do you have concerns about that this is becoming really President Obama's war and the, and the impact uh, on our country in the future? Look, I, again, uh, you know, and I, I don't have to say anything nice. I don't, I'm not in the administration, but I'm with Obama on his conduct of the war. I always said when I was running against the Iraq war that the Afghanistan was different. Let me tell you what the stakes are now. And, and what I find incredibly refreshing about this president is he uttered words that Lyndon Johnson never said, which is that we cannot win this war militarily. He knows that from the get-go. Here's what's at stake. It's not just the Taliban. I think we could probably control the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda in the Northwest Territories by doing some of the things we're already doing, drones and air power and so forth. F roughly 50 percent of the Afghan people are women. They will be condemned to conditions which are very much like slavery and serfdom uh, in a 12th century uh, model of society where they have no rights whatsoever. So I'm not saying we have to invade every country that doesn't treat women as, as equal, but we're there now. We have a responsibility, and if we leave, women will experience the most extraordinary depreda depredations of any uh, population on the face of the earth. I think we have some obligation to try and see if we can make this work, uh, not just for America and our security interests, but for the sake of women in Afghanistan and all around the globe. Is, is this acceptable to treat women like this? I think not. We just interviewed an Afghan parliamentarian, Dr. Vordok. She said the opposite. She said, yes, she agrees with you on the way women are treated, but that this is worsening the treatment, that the increased number of civilian deaths in Afghanistan, the huge number of troops that are coming in right now are alienating the Afghan population. Well, that, and that's the, that is the clear challenge for this president and for the generals who are over there is can they stop that? Because if they don't, we'll be out of there uh, much faster than we ought to be, and we will be leaving behind 50% uh, of a population who are going to experience uh, horrendous uh, depredations and set back the cost of women's equality around the world by decades. And finally, about, we have about a, about a minute. Uh, EFCA. Uh, the reports today that several seven de Democrats supported apparently by the l labor leaders have agreed to give up the card check uh, uh, portion of the labor reform bill. And this is a hard issue to do in a minute or less. But, okay, EFCA, the Employee Free Choice Act, was basically a product of the horrendous attacks on the National Labor Relations Board and on unions in general and on working people in general over the last eight years under Bush. They basically perverted the labor law and allowed companies to do un outrageous and illegal things in terms, so you could actually win an election and never get a contract. There are ways, so it was this, it, the EFCA was the solution, but it's not the only solution. Now, I know nothing about this. I just found out about this on the show this morning when I walked in the door, so I don't know what's behind it. But there are other ways that you can make the labor law fair again after it's been uh, attacked so badly for the last eight years, and maybe they've come to a compromise and figured out a way to, to make the labor laws work so that ordinary people can make a decent wage again. Why do you think you were passed over for oh, Health and Human Services, Surgeon General, when you were the author of the 50-state strategy? Well, I wasn't passed over for Surgeon General because I didn't want that, that particular job. You know, I, I, who knows? I, I, I've learned in Washington it's better not to speculate about other people's motives. But, you know... Uh, now you're chair of the Progressive Book Club? Now I'm chair of the Progressive Book Club, which is much different than being secretary of HHS. But the truth is... I'm really enjoying my role as, a, as an advocate. I can say things and do things and rally audiences that I could never do. So, you know, people make contributions, and sometimes you don't make one the way you'd like to, but sometimes it turns out to be Howard okay. Dean, thank you so much for joining us. Howard Dean's Prescription for Real Health Care Reform. I want to thank our producers, Mike Berkshire, Fodok Deuce, Anjali Comet, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.